How is everyone today? A few of you saw uh, the dress rehearsal last night of the play. Did you like it? You liked it. Yeah, you liked it. Uh, it begins tonight, uh, 7.30, runs till Thursday, or Thursday, Friday, Saturday, 7.30, Sunday at 2. Don't miss it. Uh, I think it's going to be okay. I think it's going to do all right. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, with that said, let's get on and talk about uh, theater of diversity. I think the last person I talked about uh, was, who did I talk about last? Paul Robeson. What did he do? Pretty incredible guy. He did a lot of stuff. Um, I found my PowerPoint. I couldn't get it to work. And uh, I don't use PowerPoints very often, but I have to learn because I'm going to be teaching this class online this summer. So if you, have any, if you like the class, tell your friends. Uh, that's why we've been recording this. Uh, some of the, these lectures are going to show up in my summer class. Uh, but second session of summer school, I'm going to be teaching it. And I'm trying to learn how to do PowerPoint and stuff so I can, you know, put it on my online class. Uh, usually if I touch a computer, it blows up. So this has been a little humorous for me to teach an online class, but I, I really want to learn to do it. And anyway, with my PowerPoint, uh, I wanted to show you some pictures of the people that I'm talking about. Can, I hope you can see that okay without me turning lights off because I want to do notes and stuff. This guy here, this is James Hewlett. He was one of the actors at the African Grove Theater. And this is a, a, an artist rendering that was done from the period of him in uh, Richard III. Um, so that's, that's James Hewlett. That's what he looked like. And dun, 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 here I go. <laughs> Ira Aldridge. That's him wearing a lot of the medals that he received as an actor over in Europe. Um, he was especially uh, popular in Poland. Uh, but he got, you know, uh, lots and lots of, of um, medals and, and awards for his acting. And he was also in the African Company. That's Carlisle Brown. That's the gentleman who wrote um, The African Company Presents Richard III. He's a playwright now. Uh, and he also wrote Buffalo Hair. There's Paul Robeson, the handsome guy. He's a good-looking man. And there he is when he played football, when he was a professional football player. What about uh, those helmets, huh? That's what the ETSU team is going to wear after they find out they have no money. Uh, they're going to go back to that. And now I'm up to James Baldwin, where I wanted to be. James Baldwin is, everybody I'm going to show you today know they're important. James Baldwin is a playwright. Um, he was born in Harlem, New York City, in Harlem, 1924. That date's not important. The date just to kind of give you an idea when he was around. I won't ask you the date. What's interesting about James Baldwin, um, his father was a preacher and in his early life, Baldwin thought that he was going to fo follow his father's footsteps. Um, but when he was 18, he decided that was not for him. He did not want to be a preacher. He moves to Greenwich Village, and he becomes a freelance writer. In 1948, he goes to Paris, and... He starts his real professional writing career in Paris. Now, there's a reason that he went to Paris, other than the fact that he thought it would be fun to live there and write there. Why would an African-American writer go to Paris in 1948? 
more freedom. He would be accepted there. His talents would be accepted there. Um, and he begins to write. Uh, he works in Paris. He also goes to Switzerland and does some writing. He writes first a novel that makes him famous. It was called Go Tell It on the Mountain, which was an autobiographical story about him growing up in Harlem. But in 1954, he writes a play called The Amen Corner. The Amen Corner. It's a play about faith and family. It talks about, uh, uh, deals with a lot of different topics, not just faith and family, but within that it also talks about the differences between African American men and African American women. And the characters uh, have, get into discussions about that. And also fathers and sons. He had some issues with his father and he brings them up in this play. The play uh, was a success and it is still considered one of the masterpieces of modern American theater. One of the masterpieces of modern American theater. That sounds like a test question. One of the masterpieces of modern American theater, The Amen Corner. He would later write another play called Blues for Mr. Charlie. This was in 64. Blues for Mr. Charlie is about racism. And it's a pretty bitter play. It's about racist oppression. And it's also considered one of the great American plays. Blues for Mr. Charlie. In 1964. Yeah. The first one's called The Amen Corner. He wrote it in 1954. And it's considered one of the masterpieces of modern American theater. <laughs> Uh, Baldwin would go on to write lots of stuff. He wrote over 20 books. Um, he becomes a college professor at, at Baldwin University. Um, he teaches African American studies at the University of Massachusetts. And uh, finally, he had a bout with cancer. He had stomach cancer. And he traveled back to France with hope of getting some uh, treatment there that would save his life, but unfortunately he died of stomach cancer in 1987 uh, in France. But he's one of our great uh, American playwrights. And just a great writer all, all together. James Baldwin. Any questions about Mr. Baldwin? Okay. Lorraine Hansberry. Lorraine Hansberry is also a playwright. You got the spelling up there. So Lorraine Hansberry. She was born in 1930 in Chicago. And she dies in 1965. She, she didn't live very long. She was from a wealthy family. So she grew up having money and went to some of the best schools possible. She studied uh, writing at the University of Wisconsin. And she also excelled not just in writing, but she was also an, uh, an artist. She was a painter. And uh, her painting um, is considered really good. I mean, people who, who are you know, artists thought she could have been a professional painter. That, that could have been something she, she did. Um, in 1953, she goes to New York City. She lives in Greenwich Village. And it's there she writes a play that's going to make her famous. And it's called A Raisin in the Sun. 
Zundai. A raisin in the sun. It opens on Broadway in 1959. And this is a, an important fact. It is the first African American play ever produced on Broadway. It's the first. James Baldwin wrote great plays, but they weren't produced on Broadway. Not until after this. So 1959, the first African-American play produced on Broadway. It won all kinds of awards, and it is considered one of the great American plays, to, uh, and will be for all time. Um, how many of you have ever heard of A Raisin in the Sun? Oh, good. A lot of you. That's great. It's a, it's a wonderful play. It keeps getting redone. Um, it's been on TV a number of times, different versions of it. Um, what it is, it's a story of a family in Chicago. And the father has passed away when the play begins. And he leaves, he has a will, and he leaves money to his wife. And it's quite a large sum of money for the time period. And what's cool about that is she now has money, a lot of money, more than she's ever had in her life. And she can live comfortable for the rest of her life, she and her family. The kids, uh, there's a son and a daughter, the daughter's in college. The son keeps trying to find ways to make money. He gets into all these little different business ideas from different people. He wants, to, he wants to be rich. And he gets caught up with some shady people that take him quite often for, for money. Yeah. I thought there were two adults. Yeah, and then there's the little one. Oh, yeah, okay. I ain't got her yet. There's two adults and then there's a, young one, a younger one. But she's... Um, so finally, finally, what happens is they start to fight over what they're going to do with this money. And they have a knockdown drag out. I mean, this family goes at it. The son wants the money to invest in a business opportunity. The daughter thinks she should be given the money to go to college. And... The mother starts to think about it, and she thinks about the young girl, and she goes, I want a house. We've lived in an apartment all our life. The only plants I can grow are here in the window. I have a little planter, and that's all I can do. I don't have, I want land. I want to have a garden. I want to be able to raise things, and I want a house. And I've got the money now, I can just pay for it, cash up front, just pay for our house. There's some more complications, I won't go into all of them. The son almost, he takes the money, he almost loses all of it. But finally, they decide to buy this house, and the house that she decides to buy is in an all-white neighborhood out in the suburbs. And a member of the community shows up, white guy, and goes, oh, we heard you just bought this home, but you really don't want that home. It's not a good house, and it's probably not the best house on the block, and you really don't, and what we're going to do is we'll buy it back from you. And they become real clear to them that what he wants is they don't want a black family moving into the all-white neighborhood. And what this does, it unites the family. They come together. And the son turns to the man and says, 
That's okay, neighbor. We'll see you soon. And the play ends with them. We know they're moving. We don't find out what happens after that. Some people have often said they ought to have another one. She should have written it. Well, she died, though. What happens after they move? But it, it's a powerful, powerful drama. Remember we talked uh, earlier about domestic dramas, about families? This is a domestic drama. It's, it's about the family, and family is all important in it. It's a beautiful piece of writing. Um, unfortunately, she would only get to write one more play. She wrote The Sign in Sidney Brewstein's Window. I'm not going to ask you that on the test. I just want you to know about it. But what's interesting about the sign in Sidney Brewstein's window, it's a play about a Jewish man. And she, she wrote that play, and it's a great play. It's a, it's a really good play. It's not as good as this one, but it's a good play. At the age of 35, she gets cancer, and she dies. I mean, real quick, she dies. Um, and nobody... You know, a lot of people were sad, and when they started looking through her things, they found lots of letters. Some that had been published, a lot that had not been published. Letters, stories, ideas. And they were published in first a book, and it's called To Be Young, Gifted, and Black. To Be Young, Gifted, and Black. To be young, gifted, and black after her death was turned into a play and is now performed all over the world. And it's, it's her story. It tells the story of Lorraine Hansberry. Any questions about her? Okay. Moving right along. Amiri Baraka who early in his career was called Leroy Jones. Amiri Baraka. Amiri Baraka is a poet for the most part. He was born in 1934 in Newark, New Jersey. And then he still lives in New Jersey. This is, this is him when he was a young man and at that time was called Leroy Jones. This is him today. Huh? He aged very well. He's a handsome guy. Amiri Baraka. Um, he's written over 40 books, poems, essays, uh, theater criticism, and he's written several plays, and they're important plays. Um, he's also the founder of an organization called the, Blacks, the Black Arts Movement, and it in, was located in Harlem in the 1960s, the Black Arts Movement. There's two plays that I want you to remember of his. Dutchman, <coughs> and The Toilet. The Dutchman was written in 1963, and The Toilet was written, I think, two years later. I don't have a date on that one. The date's not important, but early 60s. The Dutchman and the toilet. In the 1960s, when the civil rights movement was, was going on and, and there was a lot of um, anger, there was a lot of uh, fighting, uh, the marches, the sit-ins, that's where at that time, Leroy Jones becomes a part of that movement. 
but he does it through his writing. He does it through his poems, and he does it through his plays. And his plays tend to be violent. And they were violent on purpose. The reason they were violent is he wanted to show life as it is in the streets. Life as it is being an African American living in New York or New Jersey. A lot of his plays take place in New Jersey. What was it like? The Dutchman takes place on a subway car and you have a young black businessman and he's on the subway car and as he's going down it's, the car stops at a station and he looks and standing ready to get into the car is this very attractive white woman and he looks at her and she looks at him he turns back around, he starts to read this book he's reading, turns and she's sitting next to him. And she starts a conversation with him. And they start talking about a lot of different things. The play is mostly just the two of them sitting there talking as the subway is, is moving. And eventually she makes him angry. And she kills him. And at the end of the play, she gets off the subway and no one stops her. There's some other white people sitting at the back of the subway. It's a heavy duty play. It's very heavy. Very psychological in terms of what, what, where did this come from? Why did this woman do this? It's an intense play. The toilet, even though it has a very strange name, it's called the toilet because it takes place in a high school bathroom of an inner city school. And when the play begins, a group of gang members come into the bathroom and they're dragging a body. And they bring the body into the bathroom and you discover it's another student and he's been beaten up. They've beaten him up. And they begin to do all kinds of nasty things to him. They, they dunk his head in the toilet. They start doing all kinds of stuff. They beat him up some more. And what we learn is the young man is gay. And they don't like that. And also don't like the fact that there's a rumor in the school that one of the gang members and this man have had a relationship. But they don't know who. And that's what they're doing. They torture him to try to find out who his lover is. And they literally just keep beating him up and beating him up and beating him up. And there's a lot of conversation between the different gang members about what they should do about this guy. And finally, he starts to talk. And one of the guys goes berserk and runs over and just kicks him in the face. And pretty much, he's still breathing, but he's pretty much dead. And they think that's real funny. But they're also angry because they never found out who the gang member was. And they leave. And in the play, you see this body laying there by this toilet. And all of a sudden, the door opens. And the guy who kicks him walks in, picks him up, and holds him. And says, I'm sorry. And the play ends. In other words, he killed him to keep the rest of the gang from finding out it was him. It's... It's intense. It's an intense play. And that's what this man's poetry and his plays are all about. Okay? By the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, 
Amiri Baraka quits writing plays and basically becomes a poet. He changes his name from Leroy Jones to Amiri Baraka because he feels that this ties him into his slave name, what he called his slave name. And he wanted to go back to his African roots. And after research, came up with the name Amiri Baraka. And that's still his name to this day. Um, he's still in New Jersey. Um, for a while, he was the state poet laureate of New Jersey. That takes a lot of doing. He's, he's a great poet. And um, he continues to teach um, in uh, New Jersey. Uh, and um, he's happily married and has a pretty big family. Um, any questions about Amiri Baraka or Leroy Jones? I actually acted when I was in college in the, t the play The Toilet. And uh, I'll tell you, it was every night when you got done working on that one, you'd be worn out. I mean, it just, it was so emotional uh, to, to do that play. I don't know where that came from. All right. The next person that we're going to talk about is a playwright and a director and producer. Bum, ba -dum. George C. Wolfe. Remember this guy, Joseph Papp? Talked about him in musical theater. Okay. Joseph Papp was the artistic director of the Public Theater in New York and also the artistic director of, of um, Shakespeare in the Park in New York. When he retired, George C. Wolfe replaced him. He is still, to this day, the artistic director of the Public Theater and the artistic director of Shakespeare in the Park, George C. Wolfe. Like I said, he's a writer though. He wrote a play called The Colored Museum. That was in 1986. Um, it's a celebrated play. It's, it's a, it's a, an interesting play. Let me see if I've got this picture here. Yeah, there, that's from the Colored Museum. If I talked about this, you wouldn't believe it. So I had to, sh I had to go find a picture to show you. Huh? You've, you've, seen, it, you've seen it before? I read the, um, not the screenplay, but the, um, the script? Yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful play. What, what he did with the Colored Museum he sets up the play as though you're, you're visiting a museum about African Americans. The Colored Museum. And as you go through, you're looking at different exhibits. And so it's a bunch of short little stories, short little sketches. And each sketch is about somebody different, different time periods, different people. But it's all taking place looking at a variety of different African Americans going back into history. And it's really wild the way he does it. The very first scene, this lady comes out, she's a, an airline stewardess. And at least that's how she's dressed. And she starts talking to the audience as though they're the people that she's talking to. And you discover you're not on an airplane, you're on a slave ship. And so one of the things, she says, when the fasten your shackles button comes on, please fasten your shackles, do not move, lay still on the bottom of the boat. And she goes through this whole thing about what it was been like if you had been traveling to America as a slave on a slave ship. And then it just goes on from there. And it goes up into modern times. It's a brilliant play, um, and uh, some of it 
is hilarious. And then sometimes you're laughing and you stop and you go, oh my God, what am I laughing at? This is horrible. Uh, it's just one of those kinds of plays. Um, George C. Wolfe uh, has done a lot since he's been the artistic director of the uh, Shakespeare Festival and the Public Theater. Um, he helped to create the musical, I love the name of this, Bring in De Noise, Bring in De Funk, uh, which uh, is a wonderful musical, and it got him a Tony Award for his directing. Uh, and he's directed many, many, many different shows there and continues to do so. And he's world famous for his, his great directing. He's also continued what Joseph Papp started, bringing uh, artists into the public theater uh, from a variety of, of different ethnic groups uh, and different types of plays, uh, bringing in lots of new plays by new playwrights. And one of the ones that he brought in, who's now gotten to be pretty famous, Susan Laurie Parks. Susan Laurie Parks is a, is a playwright, a very good playwright. The play that she's most famous for right now is a play called Top Dog Slash Underdog. Top Dog Underdog. In 2002, it won the Pulitzer Prize for Drama. Pulitzer Prize. Um, it's a story about two brothers, their rivals, um, the play deals a lot. The one had been a street hustler. Uh, he was especially good at, at doing crooked card games with people and, and, and taking their money. His younger brother wants to be like him, and the older brother does not like that. Uh, there's a lot of uh, sibling rivalry between the two. And what's interesting about the play, or at least I think it's interesting, the two characters' names are Lincoln and Booth. And they keep fight, fighting throughout the play to decide who is the player and who's being played. And it's about game playing. They play games with each other, each trying to top the other. Uh, it's a great play, and as I said, it won the Pulitzer Prize in 2002. She continues to write. She's writing stuff as we sit here. She's probably at home writing right now. Uh, but she's, she's one of the up-and-coming great playwrights in the United States and the world. Uh, not bad to be a young woman and win a Pulitzer for one of your first plays. So uh, I expect you'll hear a lot more about her. Any questions? Okay, we're moving right along. Now we're going to talk about one of my favorite playwrights. A fellow by the name of August Wilson. God. August Wilson. August Wilson's a playwright. He was born in 1945. And he is from the city that's provided six Super Bowls. Six-time award-winning Super Bowl champs, Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> Six Super Bowl champs. Just remember, August Wilson, he's from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, home of the six-time 
Super Bowl champs. They have six rings. No other team has six rings. <laughs> they have six. They've played in eight Super Bowls. But they have six rings. And that's where August Wilson's from, the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Home of the six-time winning <laughs> black and gold <laughs> Pittsburgh Steelers winner of six Super Bowls. It's the city of champions and the Pittsburgh Pirates. Six. I'm glad you asked that question. Six Super Bowls. August Wilson. All his plays are about living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, they, he, he wrote a number of plays and they're all historical. They go back into time and, and he takes you through different periods of living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Different periods different kinds of people. Most of them are domestic dramas though. They deal with families living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, home of the six-time Super Bowl champs, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, one of his plays, I'm not going to ask you this one, for example, is called Ma, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Um, it won all kinds of awards, but what it is, it's a story of, of, of a woman who uh, sang in, in the vaudeville times, in, um, and it's, it's about Ma Rainey, She's, and, and there's a lot of music in it because she is a singer. The two plays that I want you to remember though, very important, I'm not just playing around. <laughs> Fences and the piano lesson. Fences won Mr. Wilson his first Pulitzer Prize for drama. It appeared on Broadway. Anybody know who this is? James Earl Jones. It starred James Earl Jones. I got to see this performance. It's one of, one of the great moments in my life to see James Earl Jones live on Broadway uh, playing in Fences. Fences is a story of a, a man named Troy uh, Maxson who at, that, at the time of the play is a garbage collector in Pittsburgh and we learn in the play that he had a chance to become a professional baseball player, at least he was good enough to have been a professional baseball player and he played in what were then called the Negro Leagues. And unfortunately, because of segregation, he never got the opportunity. By the time uh, they allowed blacks to play in the majors, he was too old. So he never got to play. He's bitter about that, very bitter. And his son uh, is graduating from high school and has been offered a college scholarship to play football for, uh, at a university. And there's a confrontation in the play because what happens is Troy tells his son, you don't take this. You're not going to get an education because you play football. I'm not going to let them screw you over the way I was screwed over. And there's a huge fight there. The mother wants Troy to let the son play, go to college, get an education. He keeps fighting. He said, if they offered him a scholarship for his brains, I would. But they just want him. They're going to use him. They're going to use him up. Once they're done using him up, there goes his scholarship. He won't graduate. And if you keep up with college sports, this happens a lot. 
people play athletics and never get to finish school. And so he's got a good argument here. Well, as the play gets more complicated, all of a sudden this lady shows up at the house with a baby. And she goes, Troy, I don't have the money to keep it. It's yours. Here. And Mama's not too happy about this. His wife goes crazy. And eventually, though, she decides to take the baby in. She tells Troy their marriage is over, except he's going to stay there in that house, and he's going to send his son to college, and she'll help raise the baby. And the story ends with the son heading off to college, and we're not sure what's going to happen with the family after that. Uh, but, he, but she is not happy. This play has also uh, been done uh, with other stars. Here's someone else that was in Fences. Who's that? Hmm? Denzel. Yeah, Denzel Washington did it on Broadway. So uh, it's an incredible, incredible play. Um, the other play, we're going to watch this um, next week, The Piano Lesson. So I'm not going to talk about it a lot other than to say it won him his second Pulitzer Prize in drama. Wilson would continue to write plays. Um, his last play was called Radio Golf. I'm not going to ask you that on the test. It came out in 2005, and in October of 2005, he died of liver cancer at the age of 60. So again, another career cut short because of cancer. But a great, great American playwright who was from <laughs> Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, home of the six-time Super Bowl champs. Yeah? Which one was your favorite like, out of all the plays that he wrote? I think uh, the Immaculate Reception was my favorite moment. Oh, no, you're talking about Wilson. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, my favorite are these two. I, I, I love both of them. Uh, I think Fences is the better play, though. I think it's, it's the best of his plays. When you said on uh, Earl Jones and Zell, did they play Troy in the son? They played, both of them played the dad. Okay. Yeah. And um, James Earl Jones did it first in the first time, and then it, it came back to Broadway later, and Denzel was in it. It's, uh, it's a great play. It's going to continue to be done over and over and over again. It's just one of those great plays. And uh, it's wild. When they did it on Broadway, one of the things that uh, I liked about it, the set, it all takes place in the backyard of their house. And there's this giant tree that they talk about a lot. They sit under the tree. It's shady. And there's a limb of the tree, and there's a, there's a rope hanging down with a baseball hook to it. And that's what he's doing with the bat. In the play, he just gets his, when he gets worked up about something, he goes out there and he keeps hitting the ball. And, I mean, they were knocking the, James Earl Jones was knocking the hell out of that ball uh, on stage. And he just kept hitting it, you know, and then it would fly around the stage and then it would come back and he'd hit it again. And uh, I, I just thought that was real cool that they had that in the play. So, but it's a great play. Uh, if you ever have an opportunity to see it, please do. Okay. Any questions about that? <laughs> black and yellow, black and yellow, black and yellow. Okay, well, let's talk about um, some other theater traditions. And we'll start by talking about Asian American theater. There are three traditions from Asia that have come to the United States, Indian, Chinese, and Japanese. I guess I should say the three traditions that, ha that had the most effect 
on American theater. Indian, Chinese, and Japanese. There's a great tradition of theater in all three of these countries. In India, it goes back to around 320 AD. And there was a playwright named Kaila Desa. It's a long A, long A. Kaila Desa. And he wrote a play called The Remembrance of Shakuntala. The Remembrance of Shakuntala. Um, this is considered a Sanskrit play. It's a, pretty, it's a drama, it's a tragedy actually. Uh, it's a story of a king and on a hunting troop, uh, a hunting troop, a hunting trip, he meets Shakuntala, who is the adopted daughter of a sage, and he marries her. And then he gets summoned back to court. He leaves her and she's pregnant with his child. And that makes the sage, the wise man, the magician, angry. And he puts a curse on him. At the end of the play, uh, he goes, he he wants to make up for the wrong he's done this woman and his child and he goes looking for her. And finally at the end they're re reunited and they become a, a family. That's what that story is about. Be able to recognize playwright and the play. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. In China, there's also a tradition of theater. They liked tragedies. And the romance of the Western Chamber by Wang Shifu, I believe. The pronunciation I'm a little shaky on. This is a story of, um, again, it's a story of, an, uh, of a young man and a young woman. They date one another for a while. Uh, the lady's maid brings them together. The lady loses her virginity. And similar to the other story, he decides uh, because he's royalty, he has to go back to the capital and he leaves her. Unlike the other story, he never goes back and it ends in tragedy. Again, remember Wang Shifu, The Romance of the Western Chamber. Here's a picture from a modern production. This is still produced. This is a modern production of it. And that's what it would look like. Okay. Did he take her makeup or did somebody else? Huh? I said, did he take her makeup or did somebody else? He did. Lost me for a second. Yes. He was the guilty party. He did her a great disservice and then left her. See, I'm going back to the palace. Stay out here and be a nothing. Yeah. 
All right. In Japan, there are several theater forms. The two I want you to know are bunraku. Bunraku. Bunraku is is puppet theater. And kabuki. Kabuki is is live theater. I'll, I'll explain these a little bit more. Bunraku's been around for, for hundreds of years and in this picture what you see the idea in this form of theater is the operator these puppets are about this big they're pretty big and the operator does not hide the operator of the puppet stands there with the puppet and moves with the puppet as though they are a person. They speak for the puppet. The puppet mouths and arms and stuff might be worked. And what happens if you see it done well is you forget the puppeteer standing there. They're usually dressed in black. Um, he's got on a black robe with some white on it. And these puppets are very lifelike in terms of uh, the way they're uh, carved and in the way uh, that they are painted. The costuming on them. Um, it's still performed today. In fact, here in the United States, when we say these, these have affected us, there are several uh, companies in the United States that do bunraku types of, of uh, acting here. I don't know if you've ever heard of them or seen them, but there's a, a national, yeah. Um, is that the type of, of place that like, they used to do the Lion King on Broadway? Yeah, it the Lion King is a good example of a, our Western theater that developed from this kind of influence. Thank you for bringing that up. That's great. Yeah. But in the United States here, there are touring companies that go around. It's a national program called the Kids on the, uh, Kids on the Block. Have any of you ever heard of them? Not the singing group. That's new Kids on the Block. You heard of Kids on the Block? Kids on the Block are, are the same type of puppets. They're big puppets like this. And each puppet has a disability. And what they do, they, go, it's, they have little scripts. They're 10 minutes long. And they go into schools and they teach young children that people with disabilities are no different than any other people. And the characters have little stories, they you know, have a little scene, and then it's designed so the puppet then can answer questions. Not the operator, but the puppet asks, answers questions from the little kids about their disability or anything they want to know. And there are all different types of, of uh, disabilities. Uh, there's a deaf puppet that signs. Uh, there's, a, uh, uh, there's one that has multiple sclerosis. And I think he's the coolest one. He's got a, a little um, wheelchair. So the operator's got, works the puppet and the wheelchair. And he does stuff like he likes to pop wheelies. And he, he you know, does all these great things in, in the thing. Um, but they're wonderful scripts. And um, like I said, they travel to schools all over the United States. But it's done. It's, it's based on this. It's, it's taken straight from this. But this is still performed in Japan. This is a relatively new picture here. Let me see what's my next picture here. Kabuki. Kabuki theater. The actors are trained from childhood. It's been with us since the 1600s, and it's still performed in Japan. They, the acting in it is very stylized. They do big movements. When they walk, they just don't walk. The actors take big, giant steps, and that's what you can see going on here. What is interesting about it, it's all male. Women are not allowed in Kabuki theater, even till today. Uh, and the women's roles are played by men. And like I said, they start working when they're little kids. They, they get involved in these companies. And so they continue to play. Here's a picture of lovers. And if you look at her, 
If I hadn't told you that it was a man, you would not have guessed. I doubt it. They, they're very convincing. And with all the makeup they wear and everything. The stories tend to be tragedies. They're bigger than life. Uh, and they're tied into the culture of Japan. Kabuki theater. Why aren't women allowed to play? It's just a tradition. And they still follow that. I had a student uh, a few years ago who was uh, from Japan and she told a great story that one of her childhood playmates uh, wanted to be in the Kabuki theater and auditioned and basically left home and went to train. And he was uh, the woman, he plays the woman character and she was telling about you know, she never gets to see him, but has seen him on stage a number of times and talked about how, what a convincing woman he made on stage. But yeah, they don't, they don't have uh, women in the show. So no one would be turned on? Because they would know they're men. Makes sense to me. Somebody might be turned on, though. Oh, excellent. Good. Have you studied the, the Kabuki? Uh, just in, dance, in dance classes. Through dance classes. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting. I did some uh, Kabuki mime work. Uh, and, uh, man, it's hard training. It's very physical what they have to go through. Uh, okay. Okay, modern Asia. Uh, Influence one of the great playwrights in the United States now is this young man, David Wong, uh, is writing today. Uh, he's also won a Pulitzer Prize. He's Chinese American. His big play is M. Butterfly. M dot butterfly. M butterfly. David Wong. Um, in 1989, he won the Pulitzer uh, for this play. It's a very interesting play. It's what we were just talking about, uh, in a in a way. Uh, it's the story of a French diplomat who uh, is assigned to China and he goes to the Peking Opera. He sees a very beautiful woman perform in the Peking Opera and he discovers later it's a man. And that's what the, the story deals with them, their relationship, and what happens. And I won't give it all away, but that's, he has no idea when he first meets the, the actor that it's a, it's, a woman, it's a man dressed as a woman. Okay. Any questions about Mr. Huang? Okay. I'm going through a lot of people. Hispanic theater. One of, the, one of the great Spanish playwrights of all time was a gentleman by the name of Lope de Vega. L-O-P-E. My name is Lope. D-E-V-E-G-A. Lope de Vega, uh, it's funny. It's said that he wrote over a thousand plays. I don't believe that. I don't think he could live long enough to write a thousand plays. He did write, yeah, real short ones. He wrote a lot of plays, but only one is remembered. Only one was a great play, and it really is a great play, and it was called The Sheepwell. I remember Lope de Vega wrote The Sheepwell. This is what Mr. de Vega looked like. 
Now this was in the 1500s. He, he lived from 1562 to 1635. The sheep well uh, is a really great play. I like it a lot. It's a story of a, a small town in Spain and a group of bandits come into the town and basically take it over and none of the men in the village stand up to them. And this one woman, young woman, gets raped and beaten by the, by the gang members, of the members of, this, of these outlaws. And at the end of the play, she comes back and turns to her father and the elders of the town and berates them for being sheep while these guys did what they did. And she tries to get the other women to rise up and defend the town. And at the end of the play, it's a heroic drama, at the end of the play, she's heading off wanting to fight for what's right. Uh, while all the men are sheep, they're, they, they're afraid to stand up for the women and for the children of the town. Uh, and that's why it's called The Sheep Well. But it's a, it's a, it's a really good play. Um, in modern times, in nowadays, there are several contemporary Hispanic um, theater organizations um, and um, influences. They're, they're referred to as Chicano, Puerto Rican, or Cuban American. Chicano theater is mostly theater that comes from Mexico. The name that I want you to remember with this is Luis Valdez. Luis Valdez was the founding director. He's also a playwright. And you don't need to know the Spanish on this. Just refer to it as the Farm Workers Theater. The Farm Workers Theater. Because that's what it's called here in the United States. But this is what he looks like. That's Luis Valdez. The theater that they produced and that he has written about uh, tells a lot of stories about the hardships of immigrants who have come here from Mexico. And back in the 1960s when they first got started, they had close ties to the activist Cesar Chavez. And their idea behind these plays and behind this company, again, is just to point out the hardships of uh, immigrant workers who've come here to be, live in the United States. Luis Valdez. Cuban American theater, Probably the, the greatest Cuban-American writer is, is this lady, Maria Irene Fornes, F-O-R-N-E-S, Maria Irene Fornes. She's still alive, she's still with us, and the play, the most famous play of hers, and I would remember these two together, Maria Irene Fornes wrote Fefu and Her Friends, Fefu and Her Friends. Fefu and Her Friends is a play about a lady named Fefu and she invites some other women over to her house, or seven other women, and they basically during the course of the play talk about education, about men, and about each other. It's a feminist piece and that's what her, most all her work is. Her work, she's considered a, a feminist writer but also a Cuban-American writer. A lot of her plays will have Cuban-American characters in them. Okay, Fefu and her friends, Maria Irene Fornes. Puerto Rican theater, very strong, especially in some of the major cities, especially in New York. 
One of the most important Puerto Rican uh, theater companies is in New York City. It's called the Puerto Rican Traveling Theater. The Puerto Rican Traveling Theater. This is a poster from one of their recent plays that I put on here for you. Basically, uh, what the Puerto Rican Traveling Theater tries to do, they have a, they're not always traveling. They have a theater in New York City. They were founded in 1967. And what they try to do is educate the general public about uh, contributions of Latino and, or Hispanic uh, writers. And they produce their plays bilingually. So they'll produce them in English and in Spanish when they're performed. They have one company that goes out in tours around the, uh, the city of New York and also uh, around different states. And then they have their main stage productions that take place at their theater. Um, they've introduced a lot of young playwrights. And that's what they try to do. That's, that's their job. They want to get young play, playwrights, uh, Hispanic playwrights, a place to perform. Any questions about them? Native American theater. There are a couple Native American theater companies in the United States. They're, they're not very famous and they're not very big. Probably the most important contributor to theater is this gentleman here. His name was Raleigh Lynn Riggs. He's a playwright. Raleigh Lynn Riggs. Mr. Riggs was born in 1899 and he died in 1954. He wrote poems as well as plays, and he's from Oklahoma, he, um, though he ended up working uh, in New York City and in L.A. His most famous play was called Green Grow the Lilacs. Green Grow the Lilacs. It was written in 1930. Now a little piece of history. He writes a play called Green Grow the Lilacs. He's a Native American writer. He was respected. The play was pretty good. But two people got a hold of it and got the rights for it. Mr. Rogers, and Mr. Hammerstein. And they created a play called Musical about Oklahoma. It's called Oklahoma. Oklahoma, Oklahoma is basically Green Grow the Lilacs turned into a musical. They took his play along with a novel and created their play, their musical. But this was a, just a regular play. It wasn't a musical called Green Grow the Lilacs. He wrote some other things, but that's his biggie. That's his big play. Um, there's been some great plays written about Native Americans. Uh, one is a play called Black Elk Speaks. Uh, but it wasn't written by a Native American. It was written uh, by a white guy. Uh, but it tells the story of the chief black elk. Um, there's also an outdoor drama over here close by us in Cherokee, North Carolina. You guys know about what I'm talking about? It's called Under These Hills. And, and that is a story about um, the Cherokee and being driven out of the Carolinas to Oklahoma. There are four women playwrights I would like you to know. The first one 
is this lady right here. Her name was Afra Bean. B-E-H-N. A-P-H-R-A, -A, Afra, A-P-H-R-A, -A, Bean. She wrote a number of plays, one of which is called The Rover. Afra Bean is considered the first English professional playwright. The first English professional playwright. She lived from 1640 to 1689. Remember we talked earlier about the restoration in England and actresses for the first time were allowed to act on stage? Well that also opened up the doors for Afra Bean to write plays. And she wrote 16 plays during her lifetime. And she made a living writing plays. So she is the first English professional playwright. She's actually, that's how she lived, by writing plays. An interesting fact about her too is she was a spy. She worked for England and went to other countries and did some spying for England when she wasn't writing plays. Lillian Hellman. Lillian Hellman's an American playwright. She was born in 1905 and died in 1984. She wrote a lot of plays, nine major ones that ended up on Broadway. The most famous one, or one of the most famous ones, the one I'm going to ask you about, <laughs> it's called The Children's Hour. It's an interesting play. It's about two women who start a school for girls. And in the school, there's this one girl that's really mean. And she decides that she doesn't like the two women. And she wants to hurt them really bad. So she starts a rumor that they're lesbians. And the people in the little town where the school is start to wonder about these two women who are best friends and are always together and begin to think the little girl told the truth when she's lying through her teeth and everyone starts pulling their kids out of the school because they don't want them associating with these lesbians and in the end one of the women just can't take it anymore because the hate that she's getting from all over town, they start being abused, people yelling things at them, just nobody will have anything to do with them. And she ends up taking a gun and killing herself. And that's how the play ends. Uh, it's, a, it's a powerful drama. Uh, but it's called The Children's Hour. The last two playwrights, yeah, I got time. Beth Henley. Beth Henley is from Mississippi. She was born in 1952. Her most famous play is called Crimes of the Heart. Crimes of the Heart is a comedy and it won the Pulitzer Prize for her in 1981. And it was also turned into a movie. And the movie won all kinds of awards. Um, she's still writing plays. She still lives in Mississippi. And she's really funny. Uh, what I like about her this little town she's from, Hazelhurst, Mississippi, and I've actually been to Hazelhurst, Mississippi, 
All the characters in her plays are kind of crazy. They do weird things. In fact, in Crimes of the Heart, it's about three sisters. Uh, the one sister um, is, uh, has just shot her husband. And they're, they're trying to keep her out of jail. And they start talking about their family. And you discover their mother committed suicide. And when she did, she also hung her cat with her. These are kind of, and this is pretty normal for her plays. They're weird people. They have weird ideas about things, and they say strange things. But what's funny about her, in Hazelhurst, Mississippi, every time she writes a play, people in town are scared to death they're going to be mentioned in her play, because almost all of them, she has said, are based on people she knew from her home. And so every time she writes a play, the whole town just kind of, until they get a hold of it and they're buying the plays and going through it and making sure it's nobody in their family she's talking about. Uh, and, and she's written quite a few plays and, and almost all of them have very strange characters in them who do weird things like hanging their cat when they commit suicide. Uh, and, but it's funny. It, it actually is funny. This, it, it is, it's a comedy. Uh, the other, the one sister tries to commit suicide in this play and uh, it's one of the funniest moments I've ever seen. I've seen the play perform. She tries to hang herself on a chandelier. And of course, you, chandeliers aren't hooked up very tight. So the, she comes, you hear this crash, and she comes walking into the kitchen with a noose dragging the chandelier behind her as she, as she comes walking in. And then she tries to kill herself in the oven. She turns on the gas opens up the oven, and before she can kill herself, she thinks about something, goes up and bumps her head, knocks herself out. And the other sister comes in thinking she's dead, but she's actually just knocked out from hitting her head. And she never does commit suicide, doesn't happen. But she, she tried, just wasn't very good at it. I'm going to mention the last play right next time, and then we're going to start uh, looking at the piano lesson written by August Wilson, who is from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Six rings. <laughs>